great honor to be here. Uh, I never met, met, I didn't know Mark Sportowski personally, but I did see him speak a couple times and was really impressed. Uh, when I was invited to come to this, I went back and looked at some of Mark's stuff. And I think one uh, publication just jumped out at me, which he had written, you know, on the 100th anniversary of 1986, 1983, the 100th anniversary of the death of Karl Marx. It was called Karl Marx and the Outcome of Classical Marxism, or is Marx's Labor Theory of Value Excess Metaphysical Baggage? Now, I suddenly was kind of in this time machine going back, you know, further back, all the way back to 1970. That was the, the year when I resigned my position as professor of mathematics and made the move to philosophy. And that summer between is when I read Marx's Das Kapital. Yeah. And I read it like a mathematician. I worked through every equation. I worked through every footnote and so on and so forth. You know, and I was just blown away. I have really not ever recovered. In fact, I'm teaching, <laughs> I'm teaching that book. I just finished a couple weeks on that last graduate class you know, at the uh, Royal University. Uh, but, but I saw Marx or Tosky's thing and I'm like, oh, what's he going to say? Is, is the labor theory of value metaphysical baggage? And I found out he's we're on exactly the same page. You know, I mean, he was identifying Marx's contribution, scientific contribution to analysis of capitalism and the use of the model of the labor theory of value, which I had long defended and I'm glad everyone else was sort of abandoning that. But anyway, I just suddenly felt like I was in this room with this guy and we're sitting across the table and, and uh, it, it was wonderful. I like to think that you know, he would also question him for what he wrote and what I wrote. So uh, let me begin. Uh, part one, Jason Brennan. In 2016, a book was published by a young philosopher entitled Against Democracy. Here are a few selected quotes. Most of my fellow citizens are incompetent, ignorant, irrational, and morally unreasonable about politics. Whites, on average, know more than blacks. Men know more than women, and high-income people know more than the poor. The dominant position in political science is that while lobbying and corruption exist, there is little evidence that campaign finance changes either who wins elections or what policy the winners can. Jason Brennan argues that democracy should be replaced by an epistocracy, ruled by the knowledgeable, not by the hobbits and hooligans who now rule. His last chapter is entitled, A Toast to the Death of the Incompetent King, that incompetent king being democracy. What's unsettled, what's unsettled about this book is not its content. It is, as one online reviewer uh, put it, Brennan poses as the plucky outsider, daring to call bullshit to our sanctimonious attachment to self-rule. Much of the book is dedicated to knocking down the arguments of democratic theorists, which, set up, which he sets about with all the cocksure of we of a prep school debating chain. Now, I basically agree with this assessment. But what's unsettling is not its content, the fact, and nor the fact that 45% of the Amazon reviewers are five stars, another 29% is Four stars, not surprising for reasons that will become clear later, but its source. This book is not published by some libertarian foundation. It's published by Princeton University Press. And it's written not by a member of some right wing think tank, but by an associate professor at Georgetown University, who, although not yet a full professor, holds an endowed chair and is the provost, the provost distinguished associate professor of strategy, economics, ethics, and public policy at the McGill School of Business. Brett is apparently able to be in two places at once, where he's also concurrently a research professor in the Department of Political Economy and Moral Science at the University of Arizona, and a member of their Freedom Center, the founding director of the Freedom Center, more accurately, the Arizona Center for the Philosophy of Freedom, it is the noted libertarian David Schmitz, under whose direction Brennan got his doctorate. Not surprisingly, Schmidt won several Fundraiser of the Year. Jason Brennan's extraordinarily pro prolific. In 2018, uh, he published, When All Else Fails, Resistance, Violence, and State Injustice by Princeton, In Defense of Openness, Why Global Freedom is the Humane Solution to Global Poverty, Oxford, uh, 
against democracy, the one I just quoted from, that same year, Markets Without Limits, Moral Virtues and Commercial Interests, Routledge 2016, Why Not Capitalism, um, Routledge. Some of you may know this was a response to Jerry Cohen's Why Not Socialism. Uh, uh, and, oh, okay, I'll move back in just a minute. Uh, so anyway, uh, in, the, in the six preceding years, he had published six other books, and he has six, six more under contract. One with Oxford that's coming out this year, uh, ominously titled Cracks in the Ivory Tower. Two more with Oxford, two with Routledge, one with John Hopkins. In addition, he's published 38 articles, among them one in the Journal of Business Ethics, Are Adjuncts Exploited? Some Grounds for Skepticism. <laughs> and another suggesting no to his article titled, Should Taxes Fund Philosophy? The latter includes the following quote, so he's not talking only about philosophy. <laughs> I'm not convinced that studying philosophy teaches people how to think. Educational psychologists have been studying transfer of learning, and there's now a lot of evidence that the assumptions upon which liberal arts education is based are false. Most students don't apply what they learn in class outside of class. We don't actually succeed in teaching students soft skills. They don't use the tools we give them for anything outside of writing essays. So let's think about that against democracy. Uh, well, it's hard to imagine a book type entitled Against Democracy being published even a decade ago, certainly not by a major academic press. Here's something also hard to imagine. I'm Nancy Pelosi, lifelong Democrat and Speaker of the House. And I'm Newt Gingrich, lifelong Republican, and I used to be Speaker. We don't always see eye to eye, do we, Newt? No, but we do agree our country must take action to address climate change. We need cleaner forms of energy, and we need them fast. If enough of us demand action from our leaders, we can spark the innovation we need. Go to WeCanSolveIt.org. Together, we can do this. <laughs> okay. So, um, this was an ad, by the way, for We Can Solve a Project Initiated by Al Gore. So, we just stepped into a different world. Prior to the, two, prior to the 2018 election, only five of the 237 Republican members of the House of Representatives were willing to acknowledge that anthropogenic climate change is real and serious. <coughs> Five out of 237. They're saying, we've got to get on the same page. I'm going to argue that these two phenomena, against democracy and Republican views of climate change, are systematically related in a quite non obvious manner. One that has significant implications for progressive politics, perhaps even for the survival of our species. So what's going on here? Capitalism versus the climate, part two. Capitalism versus the climate is, as you may know, the subtitle of Naomi Klein's 2014 New York Times bestseller, This Changes Everything. An extraordinary book. First chapter of the book is entitled, The Right is Right, The Revolutionary Power of Climate Change. Klein highlights here the connection between libertarian ideology and climate change denialism. She recounts her interview with Joseph Bast, director of the Heartland Institute, a leading denialist think tank just outside of Chicago, uh, following the sixth international conference on climate change held in June of 2011. The conference attended by representatives of the Cato Institute, the Competitive Institute, the Heritage Foundation, and the Ayn Rand Society, among others, with speakers like astrophysicist Willie Soon, back with Klaus, then president of the Czech Republic, former Republican Senator and former astronaut Harrison Schmidt, and Mark Moreno, who's swift boat veterans for truth, you may remember, that campaign helped to save John Kerry's 2004 presidential bid. <coughs> Recounting her interview, uh, she said,
best, this is from the Klein book, best who has little of the swagger common to so many of the denialists is equally honest about the fact that he and his colleagues did not become engaged with climate issues because they found flaws in the scientific facts. Rather, they became alarmed about the economics and political, economic political implications of those facts, then set out to disprove them. When we look at this issue, we say, this is a recipe for a massive increase in the government. Bass told me, concluding, before we take a step in this direction, let's take another look at the science. So conservative libertarian groups, I think, stopped and said, let's not simply accept this as an article of faith. Let's actually do our research. So they did, and the stakes were very high. Again, quoting Bass, climate change is the perfect thing for the left. It's the reason why we should do everything they wanted us to do. Anyway, more research would be needed. Of course, there would be incentives to do the right kind of research. As Klein reports, scientists present at the Heartland Climate Conference are almost all so steeped in fossil fuel dollars that you almost smell the fumes. The question must be raised here, though. As many on the left have noted, the capitalism to which Klein refers, Klein's book refers, is, as she emphasizes throughout, neoliberal capitalism especially the extreme libertarian versions of neoliberalism. But what about Keynesian neo or neo-Keynesian capitalism? Twelve years ago, Joel Cavell published The Enemy of Nature. The book subtitle states the thesis quite bluntly, the end of capitalism or the end of the world. Uh, Cole, Cavell thinks we need a revolution, although he's fully cognizant of how remote that prospect is. Growing numbers of people are beginning to realize that capitalism is the uncontrollable force driving our ecological crisis, only become frozen in their tracks by the awesome implications of this insight. Paul Hawkett, Amory Levins, and Hunter Levins also think we need a revolution, but of a different sort than the one envisaged by Cobell. Their book, Natural Capitalism, is reported in that published in 1999, the subtitle, Creating the Next Industrial Revolution. Then President Clinton is reported to have called it one of the five most important books in the world today. Hawken and Levins agree with Cobell that the current model of capitalism is problematic. Capitalism is practiced, they would say, is financially profitable, non-sustainable aberration in human development. But they do not see the problem as residing in capitalism itself, they distinguish among four kinds of capital. Human capital, financial capital, manufactured capital, and natural capital. Hawkins and Lovins argue that these, uh, I'm sorry, all economists recognize oh, the problem with the current form of capitalism, they argue, is the radical mispricing of these factors. Current market prices woefully undervalue and often do not value at all the fourth factor the natural resources and ecological systems that make life possible and worth living on our planet. Now, all economists recognize that market transactions can involve externalities, costs or benefits that are not paid by the transacting parties. Almost all agree, even Milton Friedman, that there is a role for governments to play in rectifying these defects. The standard remedies involve taxation for negative externalities and subsidies for positive Hawkins and Lovins argue that these remedies properly applied can work. The first step is to eliminate the first perverse incentives now in place. They document the massive subsidies the governments currently provide for ecologically destructive behavior, e.g. agricultural subsidies that encourage soil degradation, wasteful use of water, subsidies to the fossil fuel industries, etc. Second step, impose the resources and pollution taxes that the price reflects the true cost of natural capital. The point is to allow more sustainable energy technologies and more energy efficient processes to compete fairly with the destructive practices of industrial capitalism. We might even want to go further and subsidize, at least initially, the technologies that reduce the negative environmental impacts of our production and consumption choices. If we take these steps, Hawkins and Lovins envisage a bright future. Imagine for a moment a world where cities have become peaceful and serene because cars and buses are super quiet. Vehicles exhaust only water vapor and parks and greenways replace unneeded urban freeways. OPEC has ceased to function because the price of oil has fallen to $5 a barrel. 
there are a few buy buyers for it because it's cheaper and better ways now exist to get the services people once turned to oil to provide. Living standards for all people have dramatically improved, particularly for those in developing countries. Involuntary unemployment no longer exists, and income taxes have been largely eliminated. Houses, even low income housing units, can pay part of their mortgage costs by energy they produce. That's a future can come again. Can come about, they say, if we harness properly the creative energies of capitalism and let the markets do their work. Well, recently, just last year, Jeffrey Sachs, a prominent economist who served as an advisor to Sanders' campaign, published Building the New American Economy, which includes a forward by Bernie, uh, that lays out a roadmap for getting us, if not to the Hawk and Lovett's utopia, at least to an economy that is, to quote the book's subtitle, smart, fair, and sustainable. Now, I myself have long argued that sustainable eco-capitalism is a pipe dream. My main argument invokes capitalism's grow or die imperative. A healthy capitalism requires economic growth. Otherwise, we get secular stagnation, not sustainability, but secular stagnation. Or worse, those irrational crises <coughs> noted by Marx and Engels, crises that in all earlier epochs would have seemed an absurdity an epidemic of overproduction, a crisis caused by workers not having enough money to buy all that's produced, leading to layoffs, decreasing labor demand further, uh, demand further, and the now familiar downward recessionary spiral. I argue that a steady and steady growth is exponential growth, which, when you do the math, you see to be insane. Three percent growth rate per year, the average growth rate of the United States in the 20th century would have us consuming 16 times more at the end by the year 2100 than we did in 2000. Not 16 percent more, 16 times more. I usually cite the economist Kenneth Boley at this point. Only a bad man or economist thinks exponential growth can go on forever. I always add capitalism. But I'm, and I'm not, I'm not about to repudiate this argument. Given the time constraints that addressing climate change puts us all on, I think it may be more or less irrelevant to the immediate task at hand. It's not growth per se that is the immediate problem, but fossil fuel fueled economic growth. Part three, okay, but what does this have to do with democracy? I often argue that we live in a miraculous moment in human history. At the same time, it's a terrifying moment for the very survival of our species may be at stake, but at the same time, it's miraculous. Or consider, first of all, had the chemistry of Earth's atmosphere been slightly different, human species threatening global warming could have occurred a century or two ago, given the massive amounts of coal we were suddenly burning. But we would have no way of measuring the temperature of Weather patterns would have started changing, and they would have been perceived as local perturbations or random acts of God. Second, we know what's causing the problem. A century or two ago, we couldn't have known, but at precisely the time when our science has developed to the point that we're able to determine that the global temperature is rising, it has also developed to the point where we can say with near certainty why it is rising. The huge amounts of invisible carbon dioxide, methane, and other greenhouse gases that we've been pouring into the atmosphere. Third, we have the technical, technological means to solve the problem. It's astonishing, is it not, that at precisely the moment when the evidence has become overwhelming, the major cause of global warming is our dependence on fossil fuels, renewable energy technologies, solar, wind, and water become sophisticated enough to replace our fossil fuel technologies. Indeed, plans have been drawn up demonstrating that the shift to a renewable energy can be feasibly accomplished in a relatively short period of time. I mean, commercial, but their plans are out there. It needn't have been like this. We could be in a situation like that portrayed in the Lars von Trier film, Melancholia. Astronomers detect a rogue planet heading for Earth. There's nothing we can do to stop it. Fourth, we 
have the resources not only to avoid catastrophe, but to make life better, healthier, happier, a life of human flourishing for almost everyone on this planet. So, if another world is possible, a better world, and we know what needs to be done to achieve this other better world, then why, for God's sake, are we not doing what needs to be done? Here's a puzzle. Well, I say my thinking on this question has just been evolving recently. I've long argued, based on the argument I just sketched, that what's standing in the way is the capitalist class. Now, again, I'm not going to repudiate that claim, but I now think the answer is more complicated than I first thought. Here's the puzzle. It's no mystery why the fossil fuel billionaires are so concerned about climate change. As scientific reports make clear, we're going to have a 50% chance of staying within the 1.5 centigrade temperature increase limit. Most of that fuel must stay in the ground. But those reserves, the ones already discovered and owned, represent $27 trillion. A third more than the entire GDP of the United States last year. Those reserves will be strengthened. Human nature, at least that of Homo economicus, surely kicks in here. Climate change can't be real, but that would cause our fortunes to evaporate. We better make sure people don't take these fear mongers seriously. Get out of your trick checkpoints. Now that the fossil fuel billionaires deny the reality of anthropogenic climate change is no mystery, but here is the mystery. Why are the fossil fuel guys so successful? To be sure, they have almost unimaginable sums of money for this book. Charles and David Pope, for example, have, according to the Forbes 400 Riches of 2018, uh, America 2018, a combined wealth of $107 billion. Up from $87 billion just a year ago, by the way, $20 billion increase. Think about that. If they were to spend a mere billion during an election cycle, as many are reputed to have done, as they are reputed to have done in 2016, none of it won't Trump campaign, by the way. They could give a billion dollars to each of a thousand candidates and still have billions left over. Here's the thing. I looked at the Forbes 400 list again and noted the wealth sources of the top 50. Only three of the top 50 are linked to fossil fuels, as compared to 13 linked to finance, 15 linked to the tech sector, the others being other. And if we look at the wealth of the top 25, we see that the two fossil fuel guys there, David and Charles Coe, tied for seventh place, we see that their $107 billion is barely 10% of the 106, 1.06 trillion of the remaining 23. Yeah, we're to 25. Total wealth of the Koch brothers, 107 billion. Total wealth of the remaining 23, 1.06 trillion. Back that way. Don't these other mega billionaires have children? Aren't they surrounded by smart people who can distinguish between arguments based on credible scientific data and the self serving other kind? Why are these guys not pouring resources into organizations calling for a massive effort on the scale and scope of World War II mobilization extended globally to head off species catastrophe? They're well placed, they have much more total money than the fossil fuel billionaires. What's going on? Part four, some historical background. In the late 60s, early 70s, the capitalist class in the United States began to get nervous. This was at a time of widespread student activism, a time when the country with the most formidable military machine ever assembled was losing a war to a poor Southeast Asian country, a time when communist guerrilla movements were, had become active in almost every country in what was then known as the Third World. A time when people in the West, particularly young people, were reading Marx again and insisting that their universities hire at least a few faculty, such as myself, uh, to teach this material. In 1971, prior to being appointed by Richard Nixon to the Supreme Court, Lewis Powell was commissioned by the United States Chamber of Commerce, a long-standing private organization dedicated to protecting the interests of business, to write a confidential memorandum entitled 
attack on the free enterprise system. Powell took on the memorandum, uh, Powell took on the task. His memorandum called on wealthy business interests to get organized. Powell argued, quote, the most disquieting voices join the chorus of criticism come from perfectly respectable elements of society, from the college campus, the pulpit, the media, the intellectual and literary journals, the arts and sciences, from politicians. In the memorandum, Powell advocated constant surveillance of textbooks and television content, as well as a, a, a purge of left-wing elements. A leading threat to the free enterprise system was explicitly targeted, democratic <coughs> excesses. Two years later, in 1973, at the instigation of billionaire David Rockefeller, the Trilateral Commission was formed, bringing together politicians, business leaders, and select intellectuals from the United States, Western Europe, and Japan to discuss common plans, a major common problem being the current democratic distemper. That distemper being too much active participation on the part of ordinary voters. As Harvard Samuel, Samuel Huntington put it in the Trilateral Commission's report, he co-authored, oh, well, that's, no, that's coming. That's the last part. I'll uh, uh, oh, no. He noted with dismay that by the end of the 1950s, three quarters of the Americans believed their government would run primarily for the benefit of the people. By 1972, the figure had declined to 38%. A full 53% thinking it was run by a few big interests looking out for themselves. Not good news for the ruling elite. Then, following the seemingly successful Reagan Thatcher counterattack on big government, capitalist anxiety succeeded. The communist regimes of Eastern Europe collapsed, and then the Soviet Union itself. We had reached, as political scientist Francis Fukuyama famously proclaimed, the end of history. Democratic capitalists reigned supreme and would continue to do so forever. But of course, history didn't end. With the threat of communism gone, the capitalist class lost its coherence. As left rabbi philosopher Michael Lerner pointed out, the rational capitalist class, formerly constrained to improve the lots of their own working class to keep them from becoming infected by the communist virus, uh, and addressing the embarrassing racial segregation that inhibited the United States' battle for the hearts and minds of emerging third world countries, gave way to crackpot billionaires pursuing their own uncoordinated individual interests. The once rational capitalist class became irrational. Or at least it seemed so to Lerner and to me. I often said, if I were a member of the capitalist class, I'd be worried these Although well insulated in their bubbles, they didn't seem to be. If I were a member of the capitalist class, I'd be worried about a number of things. One, the explosion of inequality brought into public attention by the Occupy movement's 1% versus the 99% meme, uh, then meticulously documented by Thomas Piketty in his best selling treatise, Capital in the 21st Century. Two, the Great Recession, which all our, all our uh, trusted neoclassical economists had assured us would no longer happen, did. And although the stock market has nearly doubled since the pre crash high, hitting, hitting record highs now, uh, wages have remained flat. Corporations no longer show any loyalty whatsoever to their country of origin. No one today would ever say what once seemed common sense, what's good for GM is good for America. Indeed, corporations blackmail their own communities for tax breaks and subsidies to keep them from relocating and make other cities and regions smile sweetly and open their purses to get them to bring jobs to their locales. Uh, think Amazon, as I'm sure all of you in this room are doing it. Uh, All those college students out there, saddled with debt, facing a future in which job prospects don't look that good. All those PhDs out there, uh, now doing most of the undergraduate teaching, yet often at near poverty level income. Then there's the elephant in the room, climate change. 
best-selling book is published, called by the New York Times reviewer, the most momentous and contentious environmental book since Silent Spring, and praised by the Time Magazine reviewer as what, quote, may be the truly first honest book written about climate change. High-level praise for a book which states boldly on the back cover, yet everything you think you know about global warming, it's re the really inconvenient truth is that it's not about carbon, it's about capitalism. The book, of course, is Naomi Klein's This Changes Everything, Capitalism First. The capitalist class is indeed worried, but I now think Lerner and I were wrong in thinking that the capitalist class had become disorganized, holding contrary direct, contra contradictory directions, each member pursuing his own self-interest. Much of it had. Part five, Democracy in Chains. Nancy McLean, the William H. Chappie Professor of History and Public Policy at Duke University, changed my mind. Her book, Democracy in Change, The Deep History of the Radical Rights Stealth Plan for America, published two years ago, recounts in the author's words the utterly chilling story of the ideological origins of the single most powerful and least understood threat to democracy today, the attempt by the billionaire-backed radical right to undo democratic governance. This carefully researched book tells the previously unknown story of the alliance of a Nobel laureate economist, James Buchanan, founder of public choice theory, uh, with the brilliant billionaire Charles Koch. A network is formed beginning in the 1970s, heeding the advice of Lewis Powell to quote, strength lies in organization, and consistency of action over an indefinite number of years. The network follows what they themselves sometimes refer to as a Leninist strategy. Create a cadre of full-time revolutionaries. Stay beneath the radar. Divide your enemies, etc. The network strategy goes well beyond the standard crude and obvious conservative strategies, fanning the flames of resentment of the lower classes against the liberal elite, and shifting the blame for their distress onto racial and ethnic minorities, immigrants, etc. Although, of course, they do that too when deemed appropriate. A short list of some of the key components Create a cadre of full time revolutionaries uh, by creating and massively funding issue oriented nonprofit organizations, well paying jobs for the dedicated. Create a counterintelligentsia, make libertarianism intellectually respectable in academic circles. Endow university chairs, fund programs, get large grants for specific purposes, provide internships so as to promote libertarian values and a sense of intellectual belonging that will counteract leftist sentiments on college campuses. Form strategic alliances specifically with the Christian fundamentalists. Cut back funding, for, uh, public funding for colleges and universities to make them ever more dependent on wealthy donors. Cut back the liberal arts in colleges, harboring tenured radicals who are brainwashing their students and turning them into liberals or even worse, Socialists. Intervene heavily in state and local elections and never lose sight of Buchanan's principle. Long term meaningful change requires not so much changing the rulers, but changing the rules. Make voting difficult, especially for those unlikely to support the cause, control the judiciary, push constitutional changes at the state level and ultimately the national level. The point is to keep democracy ever more tightly in chains. Part six, is democracy dying? This section title is the cover title of a special issue of The Atlantic that just came out last spring. One cannot understate the magnitude and power of the code network. As Jane Mayer has documented, the network has supported at least 64 right-wing nonprofit issue-oriented organizations and has made large, consequential donations from many, many colleges and universities. That is Scott Cole et al. and a group of Columbia and Harvard-based researchers report that one of these organizations alone, which I'm sure you've heard of, Americans for Prosperity, 
rivals in size to the Republican Party itself. It has as much in paid operated operatives as the Republican Party. They also created the Tea Party, a novel political strategy to take control of the Republican Party. To independent Republicans, the message is clear. If you don't follow the party line, you will be primary. Draft and support a candidate to run against you in the primary, say goodbye to your job. We're not just talking about bribing with campaign contributions here. Your safe seat is no longer safe. This strategy has been effective. We call the statistic I cited earlier. Of the 237 Republican members of Congress, only five will acknowledge the global warming we are experiencing is primarily in the Virginia. Where is this all heading? Last August, Paul Kirkman, Nobel laureate economist, liberal left leaning left, who, as I'm sure you know, now writes a regular op ed column for the New York Times, he offered a chilling assessment in a column entitled, Why It Can Happen Here, a reference to Sinclair Lewis's 1935 novel, It Can Happen Here, about the rise of a president who has become a dictator to save the country from welfare cheats, sex, and the liberal press. I quote from Kirkman is some like that. I was, I was stunned by his assessment. <clears throat> Soon after the fall of the Berlin Wall, a friend of mine, an expert on international relations, made a joke. Now that Eastern Europe is free from the alien ideology of communism, it can return to its true historical path to fascism. <laughs> As of 2018, it hardly seemed like a joke at all. What Freedom House calls illiberalism is on the rise across Eastern Europe, it's Poland and Hungary, with both, both members still in the European Union, in which democracy, as we formally understand it, is already dead. In both countries, the ruling parties, law and justice in Poland, the United States Hungary, have established regimes and maintained forms of popular elections, but have destroyed the independent judiciary, suppressed freedom of the press, institutionalized large-scale corruption, and effectively delegitimized dissent. The result seems likely to be a one-party rule for the foreseeable future. And it could all too happen, happen, all too easily happen here. There was a time not long ago when people used to say that our democratic norms, our proud history of freedom, would protect us from a, such a slide into tyranny. In fact, some people still say it. But, believe such, but believing such a thing today, says Kirkman, requires willful blindness. The fact, of the, the fact of the matter is, the Republican Party is ready, even eager, to become an American version of law and justice for Fidesz, exploiting its current political power to lock in permanent Kirkman continues, look what happened at the, just happened at the state level. In North Carolina, after Democrat won the governorship, Republicans used their incumbents' final days to pass legislation stripping the governor's office of much of its power. In Georgia, Republicans tried to use a transparently phony concern about access to disabled voters to close most of the polling poll, poll places in the black districts. In West Virginia, Republican legislators exploited complaints about excessive spending to impeach the entire Supreme State Supreme Court and replace it with with party loyalists. And these are just cases that receive national attention. I'm sure there are scores, if not hundreds, of similar stories across the nation. What about development in the national level? There's where things get really scary. We are currently sitting on a knife edge. If we fall off in the wrong direction, we will become another Poland or Hungary faster than you can imagine. Three weeks later, Leo Gerard, the international president of the United Steelworkers and co-founder of the Blue Green Alliance, published a piece entitled, The One Percent Has a Dark Plot to Replace American Democracy with an Elite Group Plutocracy, and it's working. His article draws heavily on the recently released U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, a 498-page report documenting condemning the proliferation of voter restrictions and calling on Congress to correct this threat to democracy. This will not be easy, as Nancy Durkert report notes in a recent issue of The Atlantic. Since 2013, Shelby County versus Holder decision when the United States Supreme Court defanged the federal enforcement of the Voting Rights Act, the court has taken an ax to the stump of voter protection every day. Proactive measures to prevent the disenfranchisement have all but been eliminated in the past five years. 
even if the favored candidate or voters of color win future elections, the effort needed to reestablish a guarantee of voting rights and put the disenfranchisement genie back in the bottle will be massive. That is a related factor with equally, equally ominous implications. Consider David Neuert's recent report, Oath Keepers announced a national Spartan training program aimed at the violent left, published by the Southern Poverty Law Center. Quoting from his article, claiming that the violent left okay, is preparing an insurrection designed to grab illegitimate power, the Oath Keeper president Founders who were pros this week announced on their website that this group is organizing and training sessions around the United States aimed at helping militiamen and patriots prepare for lethal force by the far right events, at far right events in cities targeted by right wing protest. We're going to have our most experienced law enforcement and military veterans, as well as firefighters, EMTs, search and rescue, to go out and train average Americans in how to organize their own neighborhood watch their own security team so that they are available for a sheriff as a posse under a governor to be a state militia, or if it was called out by the President of the United States to serve as a militia to secure the schools, protect our borders, or whatever else he asked them to do to execute our laws, hell invasion, and suppress insurrections, which we are seeing from the left right now. The Oath Keepers are only one of many such organizations springing up around the country. There are also the Proud Boys, the Patriot Prayer, the Hammerskins, the Return of the Kings, and many more. Last October, as you may remember, of the Patriot, the, uh, a squad of Proud Boys took to the street, streets of Manhattan after uh, attending a lecture by their founder, Gavin McGinnis, at the Bush Metropolitan Club, the Republican Club, uh, brutally beating and kicking several individuals, shouting faggot and cocksucker. Uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center reports the number of hate groups rose from 784 in 2014 to 1,020 in 2018. Conclusion. To return to my earlier question, why are these guys, the libertarian radical right, so successful in blocking action on climate change when they represent a relatively small segment of the capitalist class? I'm inclined now to say because this segment is vastly more organized than any capitalist segment that takes climate change seriously. And it's a bit of an historical accident that this is the case. Or as it happened, this segment was inspired and guided by the libertarian ideology of a brilliant fossil fuel mega billionaire and his Nobel laureate comrade. Now let me be clear, the Koch network was not formed to combat the rising environmental movement that would ultimately demand that fossil fuel ground, thus costing those investors in their industries trillions of dollars in stranded assets. Climate change was on nobody's radar when the network was constructed, although democracy certainly was. As Plato noted more than 2,500 years ago, oligarchs are always vulnerable to democracy. The common people look around and say, in essence, there's far more of us than there are of them, and they have so much, and we have so little. The wealthy elite is always worried about democracy, which is why right-wing libertarianism is particularly appealing to this class. As Jason Brenner writes, remember that to give citizens the right to vote is not just to give them a modicum of power over themselves, but also to view them with a modicum of power over others. It makes them part of a collective that can in turn push people around and force them to do things against their will, like raising your taxes, forcing you to take your share of take Share your wealth with those miserable takers. Brennan didn't say that. I, I added that. It's <laughs> fully in accordance with the spirit. Another reason, another attraction of libertarianism for the wealthy is the honor it pays to the virtue of selfishness. Classic man rant, say. No need to feel guilty just because you have so much and so many others have so it can be argued, as noted earlier, that an eco-capitalism may be possible that can address the issue of climate change, but no libertarian form of capitalism can. The standard libertarian solution of environmental externalities is privatization. You can't privatize the air. So, given the Koch network had been guided by libertarian ideology, funded by a significant degree by fossil fuel derived donations, its fierce opposition to any assertion that devastating climate change might cause a significant degree of CO2 by a significant degree of CO2 emissions was inescapable. 
Moreover, the network is carefully crafted, widely disseminated ideological output serves to reassure the great majority of the capitalist class, who, like most people generally, do not want to think about so terrifying an issue, that they don't really need to work. If there's a data problem, however unlikely, capitalist entrepreneurs will come up with the technological innovations that will solve the problem without unduly disrupting the system. Or, worse come to worse, if you have enough money, you can escape either to the moon or another planet. And you can back and you can have a backup plan even now. This is from a recent Bloomberg news story. In recent months, 250-ton survival bunkers journeyed by land and sea from a Texas warehouse to the shores of New Zealand, where they'll be buried 11 feet under. Seven Silicon Valley entrepreneurs have purchased bunkers from Rising S Company at a cost of eight million each, and planted them in New Zealand in the past two years. At Gary Lynch, the manufacturing general manager, at the first sign of an apocalypse, nuclear war, a killer germ, a French Revolution-style uprising targeting one percent, the Californians plan to hop on a private jet and look her down. <laughs> Not why not some of these super rich capitalists be immune to the stupidity and self deception. The ones who do take science seriously, who do care about their children and grandchildren. It's worth recalling the words of Marx and Engels here. When it becomes evident that the bourgeoisie is unfit anymore to rule, either with the class who impose its conditions of existence on society as the overriding law. In times when the class struggle nears the decisive hour, a small section of the ruling class cuts itself adrift and joins the revolutionary class, the class that holds the future in its hands. <coughs> to be sure, as Naomi Klein points out, no messiahs, the Greek billionaires won't save us, but some might help. The climate change movement is certainly going to grow as deniability becomes increasingly impossible. So will the fascist reactions. It's the well-funded, the well-organized Right. Already working hard to tighten the chains to keep democracy and make food democratic, will not hesitate to utilize the organizations and tactics if they seem to be in control. It's also recalling the words of the Communist Manifesto. The first step in the revolution by the working class is to win the battle of democracy. Democracy versus fascism, the former and victorious leading, in my view, over time to a Socialism. Uh, the latter is victorious, leading to species extinction. This, I think, is the struggle of our time. Moving beyond capitalism will have to come later. Right now, we need a united front to defeat the insane, the far better organized faction of the capitalist ruling class. The capitalist class has been on heading off with they correctly perceive their greatest threat, a move towards something resembling. That is to say, to avoid catastrophe, we must win the battle of democracy. Here's the first Marx, but we use the other Marx. Thank you. to make rational decisions in the 
exercise of this technological power. Three, the question of who has the ability and the authority to exercise this power, who ought to exercise it. These are basic questions about knowledge and power, questions concerning what we may call political epistemology. They arise again with special urgency today. At present, the power, receiving power, to make such policy decisions rests with hierarchies or elites in government or in the military or in corporations. The public is as poorly represented in this decision process as it is more generally. Popular democratic responses to technological policy decisions therefore surface primarily in independent mass movements. Lastly, this fourth revolution is fraught with great dangers and in fact embodies sharp, contradictory, or conflicting tendencies. Its prospects as a democratic revolution depend on some hard choices and difficult tasks, mainly on two. One, the radical democratization of power in society. Two, the education in a major way of the scientific and technical understanding of Public, to the extent that some forms of democratic participation in scientific technical policy making becomes feasible and useful, and not simply an empty populist <coughs> piety. The issue which emerges then is the control and direction of technology in relation to power, economic and military, but ultimately political power, which includes the governmental or global regulation of massive hazards for species life, some of them prospectively irreversible and life threatening for the planet as a whole. So just to know, we won't be taking a, making a list, but I would just call on people to ask questions, beginning with students and customers. So I hope you can stay around. And uh, David was ready to answer all the questions after the short to. break. Oh, no, no. <laughs> if you're on, if you're on. Short break, and then we'll resume here. In five minutes. explain why the fossil fuel faction of the capitalist class have been so successful despite their uh, relative minority status in the position of the capitalist class as a whole. And your answer is that they're very well organized. But then we have to ask, why has the ideology of global warming catastrophism been so successful? And I'm just speculating here, I don't want to come off as a so-called denialist, but uh, it seems to me that there are plenty of billionaires who support the global warming consensus. Uh, we might ask why they do so, um, and we might also want, want to know what the ideological origins of this consensus were, things like the Club of Rome, say. Which, were, which was by no means a benign uh, anti-capitalist institution, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you very much for your talk. No, I mean, first of all, I think I mean, nobody really wants to think about this, you know, and I think that's also true of the global 
but some of them are giving money and so on and so forth. But it's it's amazing those billionaires who have ten times as much money as the Koch brothers, the, 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 Koch brothers, the Republican Party you know, is controlled by that one, but by the the Koch network, you know, the whole Tea Party phenomenon and everything like that, you know. And I, and I, my sense is, you know, the other billionaires, and again, you, you want to make fun, some alternative technology. I mean, there's a lot of different things you can do when you say, I believe in climate change, you know. In fact, uh, Naomi Klein's got a whole chapter in the book about that, about the green billionaires and these attempts at carbon capture. And you, you're just hoping you're going to come up with something. Technology can always save the day, and that's a way of, you know, you just don't want to think about this. It's terrifying when you start thinking about it. Now, some of them are, which is why I think you're going to see, because it's getting harder and harder to deny, you know, that we're having climate change. And, you know, you expect to be more billionaires saying, hey, you know, we got kids too, this, we got to do something. But they haven't jumped in yet, you know. Can I do a quick follow-up? Yeah. One quick follow-up. Okay, one quick follow-up. Okay. So, my question is just, <laughs> The mainstream origins of the so-called consensus basically come from someone like Al Gore, <laughs> who is by no means innocent of capitalism's atrocities. He himself is a wealthy capitalist who wants to remain one. Uh, and I would question his, <laughs> his good intentions. But anyway, I'll leave it at that. No, I, well, I, I don't question his good intentions, and I do think there was a sense. And it's not implausible we can imagine a capitalism at least in the reasonably short run, and, and now that we have this clock ticking, it could be, you could mobilize. We did mobilize against the world, world War II mobilization, as always called, as always pointed out. I mean, all of a sudden, the whole country just shifted, you know. You closed factories, you used other things, people started planting their victory gardens and so on and so forth. It's possible that when you get a movement like that, you get this feeling that we're all doing this to save, you know, in this case, you know, uh, the Hitler, you know, uh, now saving the world. So it's possible out there. And, and again, this, the things you have to do, in fact, one of the interesting things like the Green New Deal is it provides jobs. It's not about no growth. It's about, no, there's all these unemployed people that put them to work, which again, that's also true, you know, the great the original New Deal, all those unemployed people, let's put them to work, you know, national parks, and planting gardens, doing all this kind of stuff. That's what I think we've got to think about is the immediate future. I mean, they're saying like 12 years, if we don't change things in 12 years, I mean, all this kind of stuff, you know, what is going to happen? Now, again, we, can, well, we don't know for sure, you know, you can always hope, you know, but that just, that's sort of crazy. Even if it's not for sure, you're crazy. It's when you've got the technology that can do it. It'd be one thing, well, we don't have, we can't, I don't know what to do, you know. Uh, when you've got it, why are you not doing it? And, and will you see more? Because you're going to see more. Um, we're at both sides. Because on the one hand, we're more and more vulnerable because it's less of so more and more obvious that they're crazy, you know. And yet, you know, they're, they've got a lot of structures out there. First, before I go to uh, Mr. Jesse. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, yeah, so I thought it was really interesting, and I think the sort of picture you've assembled here is like a very compelling one. Um, but I guess my question is, I'm just sort of, sort of thinking about it and trying to assess it, and I guess, you know, I feel like you've, you've presented us with a certain narrative that in, sort of implies certain prescriptions about, you know, where sort of the story you tell is that there's this sort of small, very wealthy capitalist class who is very well organized, and they use that influence to sort of suppress democracy, which would be a threat to their sort of interests. Um, but I feel like you could also sort of tell other sorts of narratives that might yield very different prescriptions, right? So, for example, like I might be in some sense more even more pessimistic narrative, as you might say, well, you know, we live in the United States. The United States has this sort of ugly history, you know, as this nation founded on you know, sort of the land seizure of indigenous persons and it's like slavery of black people and you know this sort of the thought being that for what it, you know maybe those sorts of you know that historical origin has left us with a populace that is very much sort of has you know sort of ingrained reactionary attitudes right there are people who have been for a long time uh, you know the beneficiaries of sort of established structures of privilege 
and established hierarchies, and that maybe makes them resistant to you know, movements to strip away hierarchies and demolish those hierarchies. So as a result, you might end up with a reactionary populace that is sort of opposed to you know, any sort of reform that might, you know, basically any sort of reform that they see is coming from the left. Right? And in that case, it would be sort of, you know, then the prescription of more democracy might actually be a bad thing, right? You might say, well, that's what got us into this mess. And I guess, you know, those two stories, I look at both of them and I kind of say, well, both of these seem sort of intuitively, like there's something to them. So then I guess my question is, well, how, you know, how would we, what would be the best way to settle on? Uh, well, that's why, I mean, in my sense is the, the suppression of democracy, which is already widespread, you know, it's targeted, and it's hard, you know, Alec writes the model legislation, right? That's coming out of the network. And, you know, we've also got, you know, this situation where our, our politicians have to spend over half 50% of their time fundraising, you know, they don't have time to figure out the legislation and so on. Well, you don't have to, because we've got this, these organizations out there that will write it for you, just push that through, and, you know, and you'll know you're on the right side, we'll keep the donations coming, and so on and so forth. Uh, because I think, I mean, the populace, Populism itself, they know that you know, the, the, there aren't that many climate change denials out there in the general population. There are plenty of them because you believe whatever, you know, in this case, Donald Trump is saying. You know, you're not thinking about it, you don't want to think about it. But again, and sea levels keep rising, you know, as Florida goes underwater, you know. Now, there's going to be major issues. I mean, one of the things I don't mention here, but it's something we're going to have to face is. Yeah, the United States is relatively favored in you know, climate change compared to poor parts of the world. And there's more and more immigrants coming in and so on and so forth. That's going to be something that's going to be mobilized. It's going to be really difficult you know, to deal with this. You know. But it's clear you know, that the has no plan that's going to work. It's just, can you keep enough people in the long enough to, long enough to what? I mean, that, that's where, I mean, I, you know, and I tell my students, you know, we are living, a, you are living at a turning point in world history. I mean, if there are any historians left, you know, in general, you know, 50, 60 years from now, they're going to look at this and say, what, did you, what, what happened? What did you do? You know, that's when you either, and that, that's, again, this kind of astonishing, miraculous thing. We could make the changes, not only that would, you know, we can't completely eliminate the climate change, you know, but massively, you know, relieve the stress that's going on and, and make life better, you know, for everybody. I mean, and, which is what, you know, now I'm inclined, the right is right. They understand doing what you, climate change means right, having a big government, doing everything the left wants to do anyway, you know. Because if you're, and it's like you see in the Green New Deal, we're going to be shutting down coal mine. We've got to do something about the workers there. We've got to figure out how to get meaningful work for these kinds of people and so on and so forth. It requires a lot of planning. But, you know, again, I mean, it might not work if you try it, but it worked, you know, in World War II, you know, and you get people mobilized. It's, I don't know. It's that historians are going to write about this, you know, which way did we go? It's, we're either going to be, be a lot better off than we are now, or we can be just massively worse. Yeah. So I'm actually here at the grad center now oh, in, in oh, sociology. It's just I associate you with Yeah. Uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, it's kind of a follow up to the, the previous comment in your talk a lot. Uh, you uh, kind of point out the right wing side of liberalism's uh, against democracy, but uh, it should be noted that uh, this is kind of broadly across the spectrum of liberalism as a very anti-democratic attitude. Uh, I think most recently in terms of climate change, the, the image we have of uh, Feinstein yelling at children who are worrying about how their ability to live and, and her kind of belittling and condescending that attitude of, of these uh, you know, professional left liberal or central liberal, however you define them, politicians, experts in this matter, uh, are the ones who should be making these decisions. Again, not the people who are directly affected. And, and I was uh, kind of wondering, in, in terms of this kind of legacy of, of even what we see as a progressive liberalism, again, going out throughout history, uh, even think of like uh, Lyndon Johnson shutting down the Mississippi Freedom Party and 
and uh, even uh, with Roosevelt, you know, throwing Wallace under the bus as, as things got too uh, populous for that, that uh, what in terms of us building this kind of real democracy in terms of the huge structure that both these wings of liberalism actually are really against kind of what you're arguing for in, in the actual people affected, the workers and the uh, parents, children, and grandchildren who, who have to live in this horrible world, that, that they are the voices least likely to get a say, not alone with the kind of right-wing libertarian liberalism, but even with the, the supposed liberalism that, that speaks for them. Uh, what, in terms of that, in shaping this democratic project, would you see? Well, there, I mean, this is where, you know, I think the time frame makes such a difference, you know. I mean, back, you know, the other liberals, when no one was talking about the end of capitalism, we've got to do something about racism. We, again, it's interesting how things have changed. Lyndon Johnson declares war on poverty, you know. Maybe, you know, most of you won't remember, but, you know, back in that period of time, in the 60s, Someone. Michael Harrington, a socialist, wrote a book, The Other America, pointing out there was poverty in the United States, you know, in Appalachia, in inner cities. Most citizens, myself, I was a student of that. No, we didn't know that. Poverty in the United States, this is the richest country in the world, you know. And Johnson invites, you know, Michael Harrington to the White House. They set up a commission. They're going to have a war on poverty. You know, nobody now. Politics talks about eliminating poverty. Yeah. On the other hand, now you're, you're now having a certain sense that we've got to get together on this. This climate change issue we have all got to, now. Not everyone is. There's going to be resistance. Uh, but you know, I think the possibility of joining you know, a, a huge movement here. And, and there's already again, once you, you start getting involved, sorry for making this point about once you get involved, you know. In Seeing yourself as an historical being, you've got to, you know, you, you're like, you change. You know, you start seeing things you never noticed before. You start finding out how many groups there are out there, you know, and you pay a lot more attention to who the enemies are and that sort of thing. And that notion, again, my sense is, public opinion can shift very dramatically, and that's part of the, you know, being experienced by someone like myself during the 60s. The anti-war movement, you know, you guys may think, oh, campuses were just all protesting. That wasn't true. There was a few protests going on in some places, mostly, and public opinion was overwhelmingly supporting the war. You know, we're stopping communism. You know, they're out to take over the world. You know, and then it just shifted really fast. I mean, Kent State was one of the triggering things, but all of a sudden, seeing the Atlanta National Guard burning students, you know. And so when Nixon runs, he's got to say he's going to end the war. I mean, it shifted that dramatically in a very short period of time. And that's what, a, you know, when you start getting a movement that reaches a certain size and energy and so on and so forth, well, you get getting to be shifted. And that's, you know, that's the hope. It's, it's what else are you going to count on? And there again, I think, and likewise with the war in Vietnam. Yeah, there were some liberal, they were probably not billionaires at the time, they didn't have any billionaires back then, but, you know, we're supporting. But, but it's, that's, things can change very quickly, you know. Uh, things are a lot going on when you service the civil rights movement was the same way. There were lots of what we want we never heard of until suddenly, you know, it becomes well known Martin Luther King, Johnson, all that kind of stuff it shifts. But, so, I mean, that's, that's what we've got to hope for, you know, it's change. Uh, hi, thank you. Um, I was a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, um, I thought this was very interesting, but I was a little bit confused about how to think about your argument in relation to another kind of argument that you might make about the relationship between democracy and and climate change, which is that you know when you look at surveys of what Americans want out of the you know more taxes for the rich. Uh, health care, uh, social security benefits, investment in education, et cetera, et cetera. Um, climate change doesn't really, you know, top the list. It doesn't top the list. Uh, it's there, but it doesn't top the list. And, and some people think that that's a symptom of a broader issue, which is that we often, you know, individual human beings kind of prefer um, 
have a hard time with kind of this long-term thinking about future generations and are more concerned with kind of day-to-day, -day, you know, healthcare, education, the things that affect our daily, daily lives, and so that there's this kind of structural problem built into leaving decisions concerning climate change to democratic decision making, because democratic decision making is going to end up in decisions that favor short-term uh, benefits over investing in these long-term goals, in particular when investing in those long-term goals might come at the expense of some short-term goods that we value, right? Um, I mean, I don't drive, but I hear people get really attached to their cars. Yeah. Um, stuff like that. So I, I just was trying to think about that in relationship to this, and I wasn't I, I, I wasn't sure how to kind of square those two thoughts together, or if you had an argument against the the kind of view that democracy was in tension with the climate change. Well, again, I mean, a lot of the policies and the studies out there, Jason and not very you know, show that decisions that politicians make are often very much in variance with what the majority of the people want, okay? Uh, and, and again, as the threat gets more and more serious, and, and depending on the plan, I mean, like the Green New Deal is saying, yeah, we're gonna close down the school, we're gonna do something, we're gonna provide more jobs for people, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna be sensitive to getting all of these things together. It's complicated, it's gonna require a lot of planning and so on and so forth, it's not all gonna work out. But, I think the sense of people coming on board, I mean, again, think of World War II. I mean, you think of World War II, that's why, how could you possibly have gotten people to make those kinds of sacrifices? I mean, Germany wasn't going to attack us, you know. Japan, yeah, yeah, they're back in the Hawaiian Islands. They're not going to try to take over New York City or something like that. Yeah, you got everybody around. But that was a political decision well, to, you know, go out and have propaganda, convince people that this was the right thing to do. It wasn't that people weren't convinced independently this was the right thing to do. No, 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 but, but again, but again, yeah, you gotta have arguments, because again, people don't want to, I didn't want to think about this. I remember when the, the, the film Global Warming Swindle came out, which I was financed by all the you know, right wing stuff. It's like, because I was on board with Al Gore, you know, and so on. Oh my God, I never heard scientists saying, no, it's natural fluctuation of the climate. And so, I mean, I even, I wrote a paper I never tried to publish it about you know, how we really can't know for sure. Now, I still make the argument, philosophical point of view, ethical point of view, pragmatically, you know, if you're wrong about this, you know, it's better to be wrong and think, you know, the climate is changing, we've got to do all these things than if you aren't. But if you're wrong about the other side, then, you know, it's the, you know, kind of Maskell's wager kind of thing here and so on. But again, that sense that views, especially on the ground, can really change, especially, I mean, it's harder and harder now to deny climate change. You're hearing it on the media, the words didn't used to be used, you know, now you're hearing it, because we've got polar, you know, vortex, you know, and so on and so forth, you know, now somebody say, yeah, it just shows climate, global warming is a hoax, because look how cold it is, and so on, and that kind of thing, but, you know, that's, uh, it's getting less and less credible. Yeah, there's got, there is a hope always that ultimately human species will be rational, you know, when you start seeing clearer and clearer that this is a problem and that there's something to be done about it. I mean, that, it's one thing if there's a problem, there's nothing to be done about it. I just want to think about that. Try to get as much as I can while I can. But, no, I mean, but those issues are certainly going to be there. And there's going to be, again, trying to stir this up, you know. No, Um, 
it seems that when you started out with the Brennan book against democracy, is when you were presenting all these things, it seemed like uh, this was an argument against democracy because of the fact that, uh, and then your, your answer is in, in response to people saying that, uh, well, most people don't really care about it. Well, World War II. But that's, a, that's the kind of exception kind of thing that requires, that gives uh, uh, exceptional powers, and uh, you, you start talking about needing strong leaders with smartly. So it seems to be that, uh, you know, unfortunately, that, that uh, the, the case of climate change is an argument against democracy. Because you need the exception, you need World War II, you need something like that, um, where you give exceptional powers to the sovereign or whoever is the leader. Because in, you know, in, in China, not that they're doing it, but you could say, go like that and say, okay, no more uh, coal burning plants or something like that. Um, so maybe only the smart, like he was saying, it seems to be an argument that only the smart people should, uh, should control this because, you know, if it was up to me, uh, I would take climate change really seriously despite what the Koch brothers say. Um, a lot of times when I see people talking about the way that people like that are manipulating uh, public opinion, you say, well, why aren't we just talking to people saying, you know, if they're suppressing your vote, go out there and make sure you vote. Um, and not uh, spend as much time worrying about the, uh, uh, it, it, it seems like there's a, a deficiency in the actual populace. Well, I don't know about the actual, uh, the populace, I mean, I'm, again, it's not like you live in a perfect democracy. Well, I'm kind of weak. I mean, I'm longer. We don't live in a democracy. Mm -hmm. that, you know, we live by using Robert Dahl and uh, Lindbergh. Uh, uh, we live in a polyarchy. You know, there isn't this class which has as much power as the re elected representatives. You know, uh, but it's been set up from the beginning. It's been set up from the beginning of the, 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 the working class. You never want to, like, people getting to decide these things. God knows, they're getting back to Plato, they're going around, boo, 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 why do you guys have so much money? We don't, you know, we got a vote, you know. So you've got to set it up, so you do the gerrymandering, you do the, the Senate, you know, and so on and so forth, to make sure that you don't have all of these people out there because they're a threat. But, but also from the person's point of view, it's like, my vote doesn't mean anything anyway. You know, that I think is why, you know, we saw Donald Trump win, it wasn't that people were Pose to Hillary, it's like she's going to win anyway. I don't want to stand there in line all day, you know. Um, and certainly, if you were a Sanders supporter, it's not, if you thought Donald Trump's going to get elected, but the polls are telling you no, you don't have to worry about that. You know? um, but when, when you, people do get galvanized, I mean, my sense is, yeah, democracy generally, how do you keep track of everything? It's not like it's a perfect system. Um, but and, but the, the big problems are not the ones that. Brennan doesn't talk about climate change. In fact, he talks about my colleagues thinking we should probably have government doing something about you know, pollution. You know, he says, well, what about voter pollution? Shouldn't we do something about voter pollution? All these you know, crazy people voting, you know, that, that kind of thing. You know, nothing about you know, it's exploding inequality. Just to say, well. General consensus among political science is that that makes no difference. The wealthy don't have any. Doesn't the Koch brothers and so on are stupid? They're spending billions of dollars when it didn't make any difference. I mean, yeah, excuse me. Uh, but no, and 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 also another thing. Again, if you need to kind of reform democracy as well, because you know I think it never gets talked about. It should be get talked about. I mean, to develop a political class, people are committed to this. Because what other career do you go under where? Spent years and years of this every two years. You, you, yeah. You know. And it's it works for people <coughs> because if you know you could lose your job, or you really got a campaign, raise funds, and then you gotta make sure if you do, you've done enough favors for people that they're gonna give you a position or something like that. I mean, how to deal with this problem. You know, and I first came aware of that from reading Tom Skagan's book uh, about union organizing. When it's flat on its back, you know, back in the was he was talking about the corruption of labor unions. He was talking to one of the labor unions. He was saying, there's democracy. I can just lose that election and be back on the factory floor tomorrow. You know, I wouldn't have any. So, thinking about how you can create a system.
officer where young people can say, yes, I want to be a political class, build in some kind of job security for that if you get elected. You know, if you lose the election, you know, yes, there'll be a position you know, in the government somewhere that, you know, so you don't, you don't have to risk everyone. So it's set up the, demo the quote democracy. I'm saying it's not really a democracy. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I want to continue on some of the democracy stuff, uh, but just first of all, thanks very much for the talk. I think it's a great talk for the Mark Swartowski Lecture Series uh, as a student of ours, and, and really think you would appreciate this, and I, and I certainly appreciate your work as well. Um, there's two comments and a question. So, first comment is, and I appreciate the, the previous question too, uh, comment as well, because there, you know, you were focusing on the, there's sort of a couple different things going on in your presentation, which I think is great, because they're, for this issue, there needs to be lots of things in play at the same time. I want to kind of you know, disarticulate a couple of them, though. Uh, so one is the speed of the transition. There, you know, there's been some great papers came out of Democracy Collaborative over the last year about you know how do you really get it going quick. It's pretty. You know, I, my there's a couple. Of them, they're just the one that, that I kind of like the best by Helen Scanier and, and Jennifer Basua um, is that you know you use eminent domain. The federal government uses eminent domain for the untapped reserves of the privately held fossil fuel companies. And then that would destroy their market cap and then they'd all die. Uh, they'd actually all lose value and they'd actually have to stop operations. You could use quantitative easing, you could buy them out over time so the stockholders don't even lose everything. That's the more friendly uh, option. But so there's 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 a you know there's an understanding if you really want to just go for that fossil fuel, there's blockade, you blockade you talk, it takes too long. Blocking everything takes too long. You know, all the power of people doing blockade, you, but you know, and not many clients talk about it. So now would that be democratic, right? So that kind of unilateral federal action. Oh, okay. So one of the things that drives me crazy about the Brennan book, and there's some fun stuff in the Brennan book, but, um, but is that it's not about democracy, it's about elections. And elections have a completely different history from democracy if we kind of have a rich notion of democracy as building power collectively, uh, you know, participatory democratic tradition, Carol Bateman, who goes back to Rousseau, I, she puts in Mill, I say, you know, you're going to be great to have a crow pocket in there, and then we kind of wind it forward. So on that, and certainly your work on economic democracy, right, and this is kind of my, my question. So let's say, so the, the, the kind of the government action of acting in unilateral but decisive ways, but we think in this very sort of public manner, right, which is addressing basic goods. So that's, that's, that's democratic. But on the participatory end, where do you see that here? So in your work on economic democracy, Worker cooperatives, other forms of collective ownership of, of housing, or you know different kinds of policy participatory planning. So how do you kind of see that fitting into your you know thinking about the transition? Yeah. So yeah. To speak. Well, I mean this is where one of the arguments that you know you want to, in my model you got to democratize work, labor. Again, you know why is it you know do we believe in democracy supposedly and so on and so forth? When you go to work, you know you lose your democratic rights. You, know, you don't get a vote. get fired when it's, you don't get free speech, you know, uh, that sort of thing. But we also need democratic, democratized capital. What that means is capital investment is, affects long term, okay, but why is that completely in the hands you know, of the private enterprise? That affects us, and again, once you, once you put climate change in the, in the picture, absolutely we've got to have long term, we do have to have Federal plan, yes, we do. You know, I mean, uh, is that democratic? Well, again, my sense is democracy. You know, you can't have people voting on every single thing. But if things start screwing up, people can get rid of those. These plans aren't working, and so on and so forth. I mean, democracies can make mistakes, but you know, at least we could, we've got a collective interest in surviving as a species. You know, you know, and these massive financial. Let those crazy voters vote, you know, that kind of thing. So, no, I mean, again, the case is so clear, I think, and getting clearer and clearer that you're more likely to count on democracy at that point. That they will, and the planners will have a self interest. I mean, one of not just our immediate self interest. Again, that's changed in Canada. All politicians, everybody in the world is just clicking on their own narrow self interest in some way. Human beings can also think collectively. Count. We're going to count. We're going to hope. We can't say count. You don't know how it's going to count. Sure, but you know if you don't do anything, it will 
So I just want to follow up on your um, comments about growth and just try to figure out where you stand on that. Are you not with the degrowth uh, line of thought? I mean, do we not have to consider at all sort of the fundamental features of capitalism and its exploitative uh, exploitation of nature? Um, your whole focus in the discussion, especially, has been on the political response that could try to address and do something about climate change. But it wasn't clear in your presentation, you were saying you don't any longer think it's really the whole story, is a part of the story, or how does it relate to your time concern? Yeah, well, there's my sense, you know, that right now, you know, we've got to deal you with know, climate change, and you know, you think we're going to suddenly get a socialist society in that short period of time. But I think, if you, see, we don't have a democracy now, but if we had a democracy, if we had something more democratic, if you deal with this large problem, you know, then why don't we have democratic rights of court? You know, we've been struggling for democracy. You know, why do, do, what's Wall Street doing? You know, I mean, this clearly isn't doing anything useful to society. I mean, one of the things I've often argued, and I did this with Marx himself, I think, you know, what gives capitalism its resilience, it's so opaque. Nobody understands how it works. You know, I mean, especially that financial system. I mean, who knows what those people do out there? You know, with these high speed trading hedge funds and zillions of dollars that are pouring in and so on and so forth. It's like, no, let's, we have more, let's have them up in democratic banks. Let's have public banks. You know, those kinds of, it would come in, it would be more, feel more natural, not weird, if you've already got a movement that's focusing on democracy. You've got to get control to see what the these people are doing. Again, you know, you've got to prove that. No. Uh, I've often argued that Marx himself, you know, you can't prove that the proletariat is going to win. Okay. Um, I say he's still got this Hegelian hope, the hope that the human species does learn from its mistakes can move forward and so on and so forth. That's where we are now. I mean, that's what I say is miraculous. You've actually got the ability to deal with this question and keep the species from becoming extinct, you know. Um, why not? You know, can't, as human beings, doesn't that make sense, you know? Uh, and for the vast majority, it does make sense. Not those that have this big financial stake in place, but I don't know how it's going to come out. But I think it's too early to give up. You know, it's important right now. I think the main that is, and you're, let's say you're seeing the right. You know, they're worried about democracy. They're the ones funding all this voter suppression and so on and so forth. They don't want people voting. You know, um, so that's the first step. Just the first step. <laughs> <laughs> I just have one uh, one question. Uh, you know a lot more uh, people who are concerned about climate change. Have you ever heard anyone say uh, eh, we should investigate uh, nuclear power? That's actually who, a great. That's a no, great question. Who, who is concerned about yeah. climate change? Is worried yeah. about climate change? No, no, no. You know, Schoenberg, you know, he was calling all the time. And that one, I frankly, I, I think we may have to go that route. I'm not saying, you know, automatically. I mean, again, until you start planning, what can you do in what period of time? But it is true. I mean, nuclear power has got lots of threats and so on and so forth. But you know, it's not the end of the species and so on. Uh, so, you know, I my sense is we got to keep an open mind about that. You know, I, I prefer not to go that route. You know, as far as the de growth too, I mean, again, you can be growing for a time and you're putting people to work, but no, ultimately, again, if you have this collective sense of being part of this project, and I think again, we can live without all those luxuries and so on. There's no reason why we have to keep producing more and more and more stuff, you know, if we get guaranteed employment, things like that. Why would you want to just keep more and more stuff, you know? Um, so, we're saying that's not the thing that comes out of this point. Unfortunately, we don't have to. We can say we've got to put more people to work. You know, and get people. You know, 
engaged and so on. So we deal with the climate. If we have good jobs for people, we have to worry about the people who lose their bad jobs and how to, so we gotta be thinking that, well, you know, that's it's around. Well, we're gonna really worry about it now, we shouldn't we always worry that we're gonna have a decent job and so on. We can do that. So that's my hope. So I guess I'm curious um, whether this account uh, presumes a kind of instrumental account of the state and its relationship to capital, um, or to one specific section of capital, um, whether the, uh, the question of the structural power of capital um, is actually uh, reversible under capitalism, because every time there has been a kind of double movement, or there has been a mass movement, in response uh, to the atrocities and the misery and the mass misery. Um, it, its power has been constrained. Elements that could be incorporated have been incorporated, and elements that were threatening to the underlying system have been repressed. Um, is there something distinctive about climate change that undermines that structural power in some way, uh, such that it can be reduced to a question of, of an instrumental uh, project right, by, by a certain section of the capitalist class? that can then be countered and uh, argued against and neutralized? Or, or is the structural power going to endure um, and, and is capitalism wedded to climate uh, catastrophe? Well, I mean, that's what I want to say. You can't say it's wedded to it because, you know, no, there are scenarios you can draw, lay out, you know, that says no, you know, we still have, and I will, of course, argue for markets. I don't identify markets in competition with capitalism. But even there, you know, we can, we can get, you do it redistribution, buy out the companies, don't just don't take the capitals out and execute them, you know. Uh, I mean, I know it's like but uh, resist that temptation. Uh, and, and no, they're going to want a whole lot of their power, but there's a lot of people who don't. And if, you, if you really can, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I don't know. Some may just feel it is crazy, you know. We don't need all this money. And can I do something? And again, you do see this, you know, on the part of capital. We want to give our money away. We want to set up all. We want to do something constructive. Well, you know, <coughs> do it. Give it away. Whatever. It'll be a, it'll be a struggle. Yeah. You've got so much stuff. Again, it's so crazy that some people have so much. That possible way. And again, you get all these happiness studies out there. It doesn't make you happier anyway, and so on and so forth. You know, so and some people start setting an example. You know, I don't know how it's going to work out. But, you know, the sense that we've got new things now makes a huge difference. We can't just wait and see what happens. And so on and so forth. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so, I guess I'm a bit skeptical about uh, global capitalism coming to an end, either on its own or through some kind of revolutionary action. So, why not look at climate change uh, maybe more optimistically? So, like, well, here uh, capitalism can end, but just let it go. You know, so like, other, you know, maybe the, the green billionaires can stop climate change, but. Uh, Let's cross our fingers and hope they don't, right? Because otherwise, you know, the train keeps rolling, right? Well, that's what I'm saying. You can't count on the green billionaires. Well, I'm saying, like, let's let the species end. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, I can't. Finish the line. Yeah. Yeah, you can say that. And people do say that. What the heck? The human race is, you know, messed up. choice in what you do with your life, you know what I mean? No, we don't want that to happen. No, I don't want my granddaughter to die underwater, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but here's, the thing. here's a chance for the exploitation to end, right? Yeah, right, right. Good. Yeah, no, not Also not. Yes. Yes.
I was just thinking that. Um, I was just thinking that in your uh, list of the fundamental principles of the Koch brothers, that um, you had aligned yourself with the Christian fundamentalists, and I'm wondering if that has to do with their views of the end of the world. Well, that's well. They weren't counting on that. You know, they, this was something you know, they were going after the abortion issues and so on. Things they don't really, they don't care about that. But we'll support people. We'll support you. You know, we want to get you on our side. We want the liberals. You know, that are calling for all this stuff. You know, we're on the other side. You got to join us and vote for us and so on and so forth. And we'll help you out too. That kind of thing. Uh, no, I mean, although it is true, I mean, there is factions of the Christian fundamentalists like, yeah, it's, it's going to happen. The Bible predicted this and so on and so forth. Uh, but but you, you're going to have a hard time convincing the majority of the population that that's the case. Uh, so is it true that the Christian fundamentalists are actually more conservative than the Christian fundamentalists? Yes. So you're optimistic about humanity's capability to think collectively and for people to come together on this issue, if only democracy could somehow work or work again, uh, do you have any uh, ideas about how we can strengthen our democracy here? Uh, yeah, ultimately, in fact, you know, I would have argued that issue that we brought up before about how we are to get people involved you know, in running for office as a serious career, we need to set up the system so that if you reach a certain stage, you will, you know, you will get, you don't have to risk everything. There will be public jobs that you can have if you reach a certain stage. Uh, because again, it's so hard. I mean, who wants to be a politician? That idea that, you know, this idea that you spend all this time and energy and so on, yeah, and then and lose and lost everything. Doing something about that dimension of democracy, which never gets talked about, because it does work to the advantage of the other one. And if you're elected, you still are going to have to worry about getting reelected. You're going to need us to support you time after time. You know, you got to make friends and so on, and have connections so that you do lose well, you take care of. Now, political parties were supposed to do that. You lose an election, you get a political party. But, you know, now, the political party itself, and, and it's also, it's hard to say why, you know, Democrats, why would you need parties? Parties require long-term special interests, you know, or segments of the population, and so on, so the North versus the South, you know, the working class union versus you know, the capitalists, and so on, and so forth. You, you had a, an egalitarian, more egalitarian society, or, you know, I just think of, you know, philosophy of Harvard, we have elections, we don't have parties, you know, well, some claims you got continental, or continental <laughs> but uh, you know, I mean, so I think that's another issue. And again, my sense is what the, the strength of democracy is that everybody's got to keep up. With it. It's just you see things are screwing up. You get rid of the person, and if you have an inclination to try to get something done, take the initiative, get some kind of Get it up to the legislature, get people to look at that. Not every, most people aren't going to want to pay attention. And some people will. And there's a way to do that. You've got an avenue here to do this. That's, I think, the strength of democracy. I mean, democracy is not perfect. God knows, you know, things aren't perfect. But compared to the alternative, uh, this, is, this is the hope. Particularly when you have a sense, a much more egalitarian sense that we're all in this. <laughs> no, no, we can't enter that. 